Okay, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for uh, for coming to the second day of talks. Uh, um, yeah, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been do doing a little bit over the last year. Um, and this is joint work with the gentleman here, in particular, my PhD student Yang um, lifted, uh, did a lot of heavy lifting, uh, in particular for the second half of the talk. Um, so, um, since I started uh, working with Michael a few years ago, we have been focused on um, developing theoretically and also evaluating empirically a lot of second order algorithms, Newton type algorithms in particular with an eye towards non-convex problems, for obvious reasons. Um, and after having sort of uh, worked in different fronts and on different second order algorithms over the years, I've come to realization that one maybe major reason, uh, if not the only reason, but I guess it would be probably the dominating reason why these methods are not as popular as they should be within the machine learning community is because uh, the, the performance sort of depends heavily on how, we, how well we do in terms of solving their saw problems, right? So these, these methods usually come up with a, with a they have a step, uh, they have an outer iteration, and they also have a sort of a saw problem that require a bunch of inner iterations of, of inner saws. And uh, their success is tightly intertwined with how well we do in terms of solving those uh, saw problems. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples of two of these um, sort of the most famous examples of second order algorithms for non-convex problems. The trust region, which is a uh, very classical algorithm, books upon books have been written on, on his theory and how you, how you technically supposed to solve the SOP problems. Um, so these are, these are the, uh, essentially what, what I refer to the SOP problems, meaning that at iteration k, you would like to find this SK, and then you use this SK to update your XK, and you iterate like this. Um, another algorithm which is pretty popular, at least theoretically, in the machine learning community is this cubic regularization. It's very similar to trust region. It's just that uh, instead of putting a direct sort of a constraint on the length of the step, you add this sort of an implicitly try to determine um, how large the step should be. But nonetheless, in both of these methods, solving these sort of problems are far from being trivial, in particular when you're dealing with non-convex problems. Uh, even though trust region has been a very well-known algorithm, quite popular in a lot of communities, in particularly scientific computing community, still when it comes to large-scale problems, we don't really know how to solve it properly. I mean, if you look at all the classical textbooks, they come up with, you know, have an estimate on the eigenvalues of the Hessian and so on. It's just not going to cut it these days. We, we can't do these things. And ditto for the cubic regularization. So, it, it became a little bit frustrating for us to, to sort of ha know that modulo this little shortcoming, these guys come with so many good advantages and benefits that we can really probably push a lot of the uh, sort of learning algorithms we're doing to, uh, today, we can push them to the next level as long as we can, we can do a good job here. And the problem is it's just not trivial to do so. So, uh, yeah. The no, no, just solving this minimize this quadratic constraint quadratic problem or, or this non-convex, non-linear problem here. Yeah. Even though they're very simple, it's quadratically constrained, quadratic objective, but it's, it's non-trivial to solve it. Um, there are approximation algorithms, but they don't well perform well if, uh, in a lot of cases. So literally we had to sort of go back to the, yep. Can you just remind me, like, what, uh, compared to Newman's method, What's the advantage of these like uh, regularized or trust region methods? Yeah, the good, very good question. So these right? are sort of the try to extend Newton's method to non-convex problems because I get so to the correct. Yes. Okay. Yep. The, the sub problem itself is non-convex, obviously. Correct. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. So it, it's hard, right? Okay. If you have a non-convex problem, uh, either one of these becomes non-convex and it's hard, right? So that's that's exactly the point. So, so we had to go back to the drawing board, right? So um, this is a challenge. Solve problems are hard. So how can we, with an eye towards uh, designing second order algorithms for non-convex problems so we can leverage the benefits that they have 
but at the same time maintaining an easy to solve solve problem, right? It's sort of like a preconditioner, if you will, in linear algebra. You want to find a preconditioner that makes your problem so, uh, easy to solve, but you know, at the same time you want to maintain some, some, um, um, yeah, some properties of the preconditioner. So this is essentially a very similar idea. So, that's, so what is the starting point in second order algorithms? As it was just asked, it's, it's the classical Newton's method, right? That's so whenever you talk about a Newton algorithm, this is the sort of a classical um, way of writing it down. So you have a gradient, you scale it non-uniformly using this Hessian matrix. We write this inverse, but uh, uh, we never do inverse at all. Unless your problem is five by five, we, we don't do it. We always look at this and we say, aha, we know, we know this is a solved problem on my new method, and I know what it is. This is just a linear system, right? And I know exactly um, how to solve linear system, right? We know how to solve linear systems. Uh, relatively speaking, they are one of the easiest things we can do in linear algebra. In fact, when you open up any numerical linear algebra textbook, chapter one is like norms and vectors and so on. Chapter two is linear system, right? So we know how to solve. Now, as a result, one of the most essentially well-known classical uh, second order methods that they're, they're found in almost every textbook is Newton CG. That uh, you want to technically take this step, but instead of computing the exact inverse, you solve this linear system. And because classically everything has been restricted to strongly convex settings, uh, you end up having a, um, a positive definite matrix here, so it's CG. So the question that uh, we started asking is, why CG? Uh, because we have so many different linear system solvers. And there is all kinds of uh, algorithms that have been written specifically for this setup. It's a Hessian matrix, it's symmetric, so why not mean res? Why CG? And in fact, Michael Saunders has a paper that uh, CG versus mean res, that he actually argues that maybe it's better to do mean res for certain empirical and probably even some theoretical reasons. But in the context of Newton CG, why CG? And uh, if you had asked me this question maybe uh, last year, I would have answered the, the same way that I was taught in every classical textbook. Well, it's a strongly convex objective. The Hessian is positive definite, so what else? I mean, if, if, essentially CG is the only method that we have taught in the case of a positive definite matrix. It's, it's optimal, blah, 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 blah. But the actual reason why we use Newton CG turned out it's, it's a lot more subtle than that. And uh, it all boils down to the, uh, to the iterations of CG. So CG, uh, try to minimize this quadratic problem constrained to this subspace, the Krull of subspace. Well, OK, so it's a subspace, so trivially contains a zero vector. As a result, if I plug in zero here, I get a zero number up here. So that means whatever I do, whatever vector I get in here, it's going to have a negative objective value. So as a result, this has to be less than or equal to that. Well, I assume my, func my uh, function is strongly convex, so this is actually a positive number. There you go, negative. And I have the direction that I get at the tth iteration of CG is pointing away from the gradient. So it's a direction of descent. And that's true for all t. So one iteration, two iteration, or all the way to exact solve, every iteration of CG is going to give you a descent direction. And that's probably the reason why people use CG. Now, the next question that we ask, all right, so but well, we are trying to extend this stuff to, to non-convex problems and at the same time be as close as we can to a linear system because linear system is easy, we can do. So what happens if it's non-convex and things are indefinite or singular? Well, if it's indefinite, that's it, game over. CG, the soft problems are unbounded. So Forget it. Um, if it's uh, unbounded, but if it's the gradient is not in the range of Hessian, there are modification of CG you can use. But uh, absent those things, um, again, you can show that the sub problems uh, become unbounded at some point. Now, as a result, I think uh, you sort of we, we started to think that if you assume strong convexity, which is a pretty strong assumption, even uh, 20 years ago was already a strong assumption. 
Um, not a lot of, many interesting problems don't, don't, are not strongly convex. In particular, these days, everybody's doing over-parameterization. So even if you're talking about an underdetermined least squares, you have already de uh, departed from this regime. Okay, it, small yeah, I understand. Sorry? No, you can <laughs> add a, a, a tiny randomization that you'll be strong problem. <laughs> right, right. right. But, you know, it's, it's, um, it's sort of strong. So you have to do stuff to avoid it. So it turns out if you have strong convexity, well, uh, hoping to get a linear sub problem solved is, is sort of legitimate. But uh, if you don't assume strong convexity, probably it's not easy to come up with an iterative scheme whose sub problems are just simple linear systems. So we opened the numerical linear algebra textbook. Chapter 2 was linear systems. So we went to chapter 3. And chapter 3 is least squares, right? So the easiest problem uh, next to linear system is least squares. So we saw people know exactly how its statistical uh, properties are. And we have people in the audience expert in solving them numerically. So we said, all right, uh, let's relax our case. And instead of requiring a linear system sub problem, assume we can sum up, come up with an iteration whose sub problems are least squares. Now, why are least squares in our case would be uh, essentially the residuals of the would-be linear system. So the matrix in this case, it's a weird linear uh, least squares because all the least squares mostly are either tall or um, short and fat. In our case, our least squares is a particular form. It's, uh, it's symmetric um, and also it could be indefinite and perhaps even singular and most definitely in a lot of cases, ill-conditioned, right? So, um, and there are solvers for these class of uh, least squares problems and the classical one is, is min race type solvers. In particular, one that is, I think it's a brilliant algorithm, uh, all the credit to, um, to Michael Saunders and, and, and his student that they developed this algorithm called min race QLP, which has got very interesting properties and so on. But anyways, there are algorithms that you can solve these uh, uh, least squares very easy. Uh, that only require Hessian times a vector. Now, suppose I'm doing min res. So let's see, I, I showed you what the sort problems of CG are and that, what that gives you. And let's now look at the sort problems of, of uh, essentially min res. Yep. Can you explain uh, more precisely what, what, how, how this is exactly least squares? Like, so what is the, what are the, like, if I think of least squares, I have instances and dimensions. Yeah, well, this is just a Hessian symmetric D by D <coughs> matrix, and that's the gradient. So essentially, that's a, you can think of it as a residual of, um, of this um, linear system. So I want to minimize the residual of a linear system. But it's only least squares because like, the, the gradient might not be in the span of the Hessian. That's fine, because yeah. it always has a solution in it. So, I mean, so that, that's done even for if one has linear systems with uh, infinitely many solutions. Right. But, so right. that has a least squares exactly. problem. Exactly. So it's not a classical least squares as in like, you know, you have a tall matrix and so on. This is a particular form where your matrix is symmetric and square and not all that stuff. I guess the hope is you get a more robust method. Is that the hope? I mean, mm -hmm. Right. Are we in the case where there is no solutions or are we in the case that there is many solutions? So, oh. so it's either you have... Um, Unique or infinitely many. There is no case where you don't have any solution. I see. I, I was just going to get to that point, actually. So, um, is that possibly singular? Yeah, yeah. It's, so matrix can be singular, but there's always a solution to oh. these squares, right? Uh, right. Sorry. There could be infinitely many, but there's always one solution. Oh, there is squares. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, so suppose I do min res. So, what is what are the sub problems of min res? Min res. Minimize the residual subject to this coil of subspace. Well, again, it's a subspace, so I plug in zero. Oh, sorry, before I get to this, so as, as was just pointed out now, there's always a solution. So I, I'm not running a risk of not having a solution, even if my problem is non-convex, which is the goal over here. But uh, more importantly, because it's a subspace, I put a zero in here, and I'll do the same trick I did last time. And it turns out that directions, every iteration of min res, will give me a direction that points away from this sort of a vector. So we looked at it, what, what does it look like? What is it, what it, is, what, what is it anyways? And it turned out this is a, uh, the gradient of the norm of the gradient. 
right? So every iteration of min res will give you a direction of descent, but not in the objective value in the, in the norm of the gradient. So we're departing from sort of minimizing a function. We're looking at minimizing its, its, its gradient. And uh, as a result, we can expand the, the class of methods that we can deal with now, because we don't require descending the objective function to uh, a much more general class of non-convex uh, functions called the invex functions, which uh, the definition is very similar to, to convex functions. And essentially, the, any function that you can find this kind of a vector valued function phi such that for all x and y, you can have this relationship. It's called an invex. And uh, as you can see, the necessary sufficient condition of uh, for the invex function is that this every stationary point is a global optimum. And convex functions are a special case of invex because this phi is just trivially y minus x. And the reason why they're called invex is because uh, they, the first time, uh, what time they were termed is, comes from the invariant convex. Uh, re the reason being that if you have a convex function, you can uh, essentially transform its domain using a one-to-one -one map and you, you maintain the invexity, but obviously you lose the convexity. As a result, sort of like invariance with respect to the transformations. So you can cook up a lot of uh, functions, invex functions, this way. And more importantly for us these days probably is why do I care about invexity? Perhaps because in a lot of, uh, you recently have been some work on the showing that the deep residual networks actually, as the layers increase, they show some, some invex uh, behavior. All right, so uh, maybe just a mental picture of where everything stands in terms of uh, invex functions. You always uh, see a lot of algorithms develop here, but a lot of interesting things probably happening outside of that box. Well, you see the convex, it's a relaxation of strong convex, and then the one that's probably more known are the quasi-convex functions. These invex functions, they sort of, uh, some of the, they, they share some points and some functions and, and they don't. So. Right. And this gave rise to this, what we call Newton MR. Yeah. Uh, in machine learning, is there any, any model that is invex but not convex? Um, so, OK, so I don't know of any model right now. <laughs> but uh, as I said, you can either cook up one like this. And second of all, there are, out, there are models that are not exactly invex, but they sort of show invex behavior when they get deep. Right. Um, we'll do so. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, the whole entire world doesn't summarize in machine learning technically, but uh, yeah. Um, OK, so this gives rise to Newton MR, which is uh, Newton with the minimum residual subpowers. An algorithm is very simple. It's just like Newton CG. It's just instead of the, uh, the inverse, you put a pseudo inverse on the matrix, so approximately solve that least squares. And then you do a line search, but instead of a function value, you do it on the norm of the gradient, right? So compared to Newton CG, our subproblems of CG is a quadratic. Here is also a quadratic, but in the form of a least squares. The line search in CG is this typical Armico line search. Rs is on the gradient. And Newton CG naturally is only restricted to strongly convex, whereas Newton MR can be extended to invex problems. But it also turned out that it allowed for a lot more than just these little changes. This sort of a, um, this, this trivial change of the sub problem allows for a lot more uh, flexibility. Excuse me, Fred, yeah. if I don't know what my problem is and I end up uh, applying your new yeah. MR to a strongly yeah. convex function, is it going to do as well? Yes, better. Good. Oh, really? Almost. Like on any convex problem we try this, it's always better than with CG, like hands down. Um, and in fact, this is, maybe at the end I'll explain or at least uh, hinted at why could that could be. All right, so, um, so in non-convex literature, if you're looking at second order algorithms, you often see two assumptions. One is the gradient is Lipschitz. The other one most likely is the Hessian is Lipschitz. And it always puzzled, was always puzzling to me why these two quantities are being considered independently of each other. They're all coming from the same function. So technically speaking, you should sort of look at them um, if you look at their interaction, and it turns out that in order to guarantee convergence of R, Newton MR, you actually can uh, what we call a moral smoothness assumption, 
which you really don't need smoothness of the, the gradient or the Hessian. It's just the action of the Hessian on the gradient that you'd like it to be Lipschitz continuous. And uh, in, the, in the paper, we show that this typical smoothness assumptions is strictly contained in the class of uh, moral smoothness. As a very simple example, you can look at the smooth, uh, quadratically smooth hinge loss which is obviously not uh, second or as it's, it's Hessian is uh, not Lipschitz continuous, but it satisfied the moral smoothness with, with this constant. So another advantage of this relaxation is that instead of requiring H and G to be, to be both smooth, you, uh, your con Lipschitz continuous, you only need require the action of the Hessian on the gradient. Another uh, sort of uh, maybe a property that we, we studied uh, in this context was uh, what we call a sort of a Hessian gradient null space property. It showed up yesterday in Alex's talk and also in the context of Lee squares, uh, it's sort of a thing that people assume all the time. And that is suppose uh, I have some orthonormal basis for the, for the range of my Hessian. And uh, if I project my gradient onto the subspace band by my Hessian, I don't uh, essentially lose a lot of its mass. And uh, pictorially, uh, you can think of a three-dimensional problem where you have a two-dimensional range in the null space orthogonal. When you project it onto the range, you don't want this projection to be uh, arbitrarily close to zero. And um, again, this sort of simplifies a lot the, uh, the or, or generalizes a lot the notions of uh, strong convexity and so on. For example, a strictly convex function will satisfy this trivially with, with nu equals 1. And even beyond that, for non-convex, in the case of an empirical risk minimization with this sort of a linear decision boundary, you can show in a lot of cases they satisfy this with nu equals 1. So it's sort of, in my opinion, it's wrong to analyze these. And in the moment they're non-convex, throw your hand up and say, OK, uh, my Hessian is singular. That is not really important. The important is the action, the interaction between the Hessian and the gradient that determines um, the difficulty of problems. Some fractional programming we showed in the paper that satisfy that, and also some nonlinear composition of functions also satisfy this assumption. Actually, that's important. You're saying that the residual squared residual is smaller, right? By saying that basically when you project F, you don't lose very much. So that, that improves the conditioning of these squares. Right. Because right. right. That's what you're related to. So uh, that means that your subproblem is, is well behaved. Right. So your your grade yes, yeah, you can you, essentially that says you can solve the least square. So the, the, the gradient is not orthogonal to the matrix. Yeah. And uh, another assumption we had again. So we, instead of assuming that the Hessian is because we don't have the uh, strong convexity here, we only require the pseudo or well, the pseudo inverse of the matrix to to be bounded. An exam simple example of this is if you have underdetermined matrix, you sat in linear squares, you have this assumption, but you obviously don't have the strong convexity assumption. So we, it tells me what the difference between this assumption and the, and the strong convexity. This is only it requires non-zero uh, singular values to be uh, bounded away from zero. You could have many zero single values. So the non-zero yeah. single values are bounded away by gamma. Correct. So you essentially look at an underdetermined least squares. Satisfy this trivially, but it's obviously not strongly complex. Does the method, the literature, do they actually walk through the subspace where this thing is not strongly complex? No. And this is really strongly complex, right? Uh, in, in a subspace, if the method works in the subspace. Uh, yeah, OK. So, so you were saying that the iterate stay where the function is strongly complex. Uh -huh. No, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. And here, are we assuming that the, we're not assuming that the single bar the, the, are, are all positive, right? There can be negative. Single values? They're always non-negative. Oh, no, no. This is a non-convex problem. They, they could be negative. Right. The, eigen, the eigenvalues. Eigen Correct. Oh, eigenvalues oh, yeah, could yeah, be it's negative. It's a generalization from strongly convex to, to non-convex. Correct. Okay. Correct. Indefinite and non-convex. And uh, another uh, sort of an uh, advantage this sort of relaxation gave us was in the context of uh, inexact linear system solved or inexact solved problem solves. Newton CG, in order to solve it, essentially to guarantee the optimal performance of CG, um, you, uh, you require this residual of the linear system to satisfy this relative, relative error. And the, the best 
bound out there is actually the one we did last year, and that depends on one over square root of the condition number, which you can imagine it's already bad. Whereas in Newton MR, what you need, you need a, a relaxation of this condition. So if I have that condition for any theta, I'll also get this condition. But not only that, but also I can literally have theta anything I want. It doesn't have to be less than a particular number, as long as it's less than 1. Now, I put it greater than or equal to 1 minus nu, because if you put it less than that, it just means exact solve. So it's a parameter-free uh, algorithm at the end of the day. So even the soft problems are a lot easier to satisfy. And the type of uh, convergence results you get, the linear convergence in the gradient, you can assume this sort of a PL condition. We call it the PL also is a subclass of invex, uh, invexity. You get this sort of a R linear convergence rates. And I think one that was very interesting to me was um, the local convergence of Newton MR generalizes that of Newton CG, where in Newton CG we have a quadratic local convergence. Here, suppose I'm looking at the functions whose nu is 1. So we have a quadratic local convergence, but not to the isolated point, because it's non-convex. We might not have it. But it will be convergence quadratic to the set of optimal solutions. So it sort of generalizes. The, uh, the notion of quadratic convergence of Newt method. And this is, uh, puts uh, the, the, the comparison of these methods. Um, now back to what um, Ilse asked before, the relationship between Newton CG and Newton MR is very much like the relationship between CG and MinRes when you're talking about solving a li uh, linear system. What does that mean? Well, in CG you have the quadratic subproblem, in MinRes you have a least squares. For CG, you only can do symmetric positive definite, whereas min res, you can go beyond and do symmetric. And for CG, again, the rates are optimal, but uh, it's only Q linear, meaning monotonically linear in the energy norm, whereas it's non-monotonically linear in the residual, and for, for min res, it's completely opposite. And we have exact same uh, duality between Newton MR and Newton CG. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm not going to bother you with this. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the second half, which is, um, all right, so we did all that stuff. Uh, but that was sort of a, the, maybe the, the first step towards developing something that we can apply to large-scale problems. So the next step in this direction is that I probably can't compute the exact Hessian. I can't, uh, well, I'll never form it exactly, but I'm not even be able to evaluate it exactly. So. Now it's the next step where we want to approximate the Hessian. And usually we look at the approximation as some kind of a epsilon perturbation where uh, we would like this spectral norm of the error to be bounded by some epsilon. And the question now we would like to ask was that uh, if I take the Newton MR algorithm and I'm plugging everywhere that H appeared, plug in H tilde, how things are going to change. And uh, an example, this is probably the only slide that I have that relates to the randomized algorithms, is that suppose I have a finite sum problem, the Hessian is the average of the Hessian, then I know I, if I can sample uh, the Hessian as, as long as my sample size is a certain amount, then I know that with high probability I get this perturbation with epsilon. But let's suppose that I have that perturbation already, it doesn't have to be randomized, it could be finite difference, it could be... It could be any approximation of the Hessian. So the idea is, I plug in the H tilde in my algorithm. There are two places where it appears, one in the computing the direction. The other one is the computing the step size in the line search. So let's see what happens. And it's not that we haven't done this sort of stuff before. We looked at it very initially when we started looking at second-order algorithms uh, in the context of Newton method. The classical Newton method, we said, all right, that's the classical Newton method. Let's put in the uh, perturbed version of the Hessian and see what happens. And for that, it turned out that uh, all we needed essentially was somehow to ensure that the spectrum of the true Hessian is preserved to within some epsilon. And remember, everything we assume is positive definite, so all these relationships make sense. Which is also equivalent to assuming the, 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 this partial order between the inverses are also preserved, which also with a different, uh, different modification of epsilon, you can say that the perturbation of the inverses is also uh, related to that epsilon. So, so that's sort of like relative variance in your Hessian's uh, square. So you need a right. square, a square, like you can't get a compact approximation. Right? Um, he, you mean here? Yeah. Like well, tilde would at least need to be full. Well, I, it's like a, a sampling over n, for example. Uh, 
Oh, so your Hessian's still like large size, but you didn't have to store like other product at yes. all. Yes. I see. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so, so all of these are conditional equivalent. Well, in the non-convex setting, so now, okay, this was the motivation where we started a few years ago. Now it's the case where we have pseudo inverse here. So obviously I cannot even have this. This doesn't make any sense anymore because the Hessian is indefinite. I cannot have this sort of a relationship at all. Neither can I hope to have it for a pseudo inverse. So the closest I probably can get is to have a relationship between the pseudo inverses of the, um, of the Hessian and its perturbation. So <laughs> in the case of newton Neymar, the Hessian, it's, it's, um, the Hessian inverse is Hessian pseudo inverse. I plug in the inexact one. And the question is, is this condition enough for me to be able to, to establish convergence of this algorithm? Well, it turns out that uh, the pseudo inverse is a discontinuous operator. So as the perturbation goes to zero, you can only hope to get the true Hessian as long as this perturbation remains rank preserving. And uh, if that's violated, you're just not going to get the true Hessian back, uh, inverse, pseudo inverse of the Hessian back. So this is out of question. Because in practice, it's way too much to assume that the ranks are going to stay the same. In fact, if anything, rank is going to always probably go up if you add it with some epsilon identity. So this is way too much. All right, so we can't have that. Now suppose I say I don't want rank, and I don't even want this condition. What can I say in terms of the relationship between the pseudo inverses? Well, it turns out that you have a relationship and you have a bound, but the bound in the absence of uh, rank preserving perturbation sort of scales very unfavorably uh, with respect to the uh, H tilde. And as a result, for me to be able to have this go to zero as epsilon goes to zero, I need my H tilde to also behave in a particularly restrictive fashion. And in, in the paper we actually showed, this paper, by the way, second half came out maybe two days ago. So that, uh, the, the paper we showed that this is a, a very uh, unrealistic, and in fact, a more realistic assumption is that the noise actually, <coughs> the pseudo inverse grows in the rate of one over epsilon, yeah? Uh, when the algorithm converted to local minimum, uh, H will, with, uh, some eigenvalues will be close to zero, then this would be infinity. Uh, <coughs> this, is the, this is the epsilon perturbation. So that, that's, that's always a, uh, yeah. And that's, that's the perturbation in the, in the, so you assume that your perturbation is always epsilon. Uh, no, I mean H. The pseudo inverse is defined by singular values, not by Singular values. Oh, when it converge to local minimum, will the singular values be zero? Not necessarily. Why would they be zero? Um, because it's local minimum. How to, how to send that? Yeah, but even if it's positive semi-definite, you can have, suppose it's rank one. So you always, suppose you stay rank one everywhere. This is just the one over the largest argument. Sorry, one, one single value. <coughs> so this is the more realistic assumption. And um, OK, so, so th this is also out of picture, right? We, we can't even use this bound, because this is way too much to ask for, for, the, hash, for the inverse to, assume, to grow like this. All right, so the next step was, let me look at the direction I get from my Newton MR. So what angle does it have with respect to, the, to h times g, which was the gradient of my, my objective, which was the norm of the gradient squared. And it turns out this direction is the negative of the projection of my gradient onto the range space of the Hessian. So the next thing we were going to say, OK, so maybe we found what the right model is to look at. And that is probably is the distance between the, the range space of the true Hessian and the range space of the perturbed Hessian. Again, we were out of luck because it turned out that if the ranks, again, are not preserved, this distance is 1. So we can't, we can't even have that. But the saving grace, or, or, or what came to rescue for us, was that uh, instead of requiring this sort of a distance to, to hold in spectral norm, meaning that it holds for all the ve along every direction, we really don't care about every direction. We only care about one direction, and that's the direction of the gradient. So instead of having this for all v, I only wanted to hold in one direction g. And it turned out that if you restrict yourself into this, into this particular one-dimensional uh, thing, you can actually say something that this is bounded and this goes to 0 at the rate of epsilon modulo this constant that is, this is the new, remember the, 
the angle between the gradient and the range space, this is not going to go to zero. And you might say, well, this is a byproduct of analysis. I'll show you some numerical example at the end that this is actually indeed a, a, a phenomenon here. It's not, it's, not a, it's not a superfluous constant. But if your new is one, now you get continuity in the action of the projections on the gradient. The, so this is one element of the analysis. We want the angles to be nicely behaved. The other one is the, the length of the, of the direction. And the, if you recall, the, re the direction was the uh, solution of the linear uh, least squares. Well, now, before I had h, now I have h tilde. It turned out that this was a lot harder than the previous one because uh, once, when this h is uh, indefinite, then you don't have a monotonicity of the iterates of min res or any other least square solver. So actually getting a bound on this, it turned out, didn't exist, at least as far as we know, in any of the numerical linear algebra uh, papers we looked at. So Yang actually came up with a very interesting uh, idea and finally managed to, to bound the, uh, the, the step size coming from min res or min res QLP. With this, again, as you can see, it's bounded by some constant, but this factor shows up again. Which is, which is not superfluous, um, as I'm going to show. And uh, the sort of a high level way that he proved it is that uh, suppose I'm looking for the minimum norm solution in this indefinite system. Well, I can break it up into two sort of uh, least squares problems that are somehow independent in the sense that I'm projecting them onto orthogonal spaces that together they span the range of A and they also um, orthogonal to each other. And if you do it that way, then uh, using a certain number of other arguments, you can show that the, every one of these steps are going to be bounded. Well, the or overall step is the sum of these two, so it's going to be bounded. All right, so there are, and by the way, this, this factor, just remember that factor shows up all the time. As a result, we have what we call the inherent stability, which happens either if you have the rank preservation, which is probably too much, and the absence of that, we need this new to be equal to 1, so that that term can be canceled. And if you have those, then you end up getting uh, sort of a convergence as before with this epsilon hanging around, but goes to 0. So things are not going to blow up. You get the same sort of a convergence, quadratic, local, and so on, but I'm not going to bore you with this. Uh, maybe um, let me show you a, one or two examples and then uh, end. So um, yeah, this is maybe look at this C410 example. Uh, unfortunately, you probably can see, but uh, this shows the uh, comparison of um, uh, this subsample version of a Newton MO uh, versus a whole lot of uh, first order algorithms. Uh, obviously, it's done better. Otherwise, I would not have put it uh, up here. And uh, another uh, run is to compare the subsample Newton CG and subsample Newton MR. And the bottom row is the function and the gradient of the subsample Newton CG. The top is subsample Newton MR, and the percentages are what's the portion of the data I'm subsampling. As you can see, significant amount of robustness in terms of sample uh, uh, sensitivity to sample size. 10%, 5%, and 1% pretty much behave identical to the full for Newton MR, whereas Newton CG, we had this so many times before. If you don't sample enough, the performance degrades significantly. Again, I know data set also the same. This is a GMM, so it's actually a non-convex problem, this one. It's not invex, but it's been shown that sort of has some invex properties. And this is a performance plot. It's a typical way in optimization literature if you're comparing algorithms on multitude of uh, problems. And this shows you want to be top. And you want to sort it's like a CDF of the performance. You want to be up top, and you want to be close to 1 as fast as you can. And the dotted line is the uh, subsample Newton MR. And the other ones are these other secondary algorithms, such as BFGS and Gauss-Newton. Again, we, uh, we do better in that sense as well, also compared to first order algorithms. But now maybe the most important thing is that uh, that factor 1 minus nu, which uh, at first we thought this is the way we are setting up the problem and the way we are assuming things, maybe that's just why we're getting that and that's something that we should be able to get rid of. It turned out that's definitely not the case. A very simple example we could cook up such that the, uh, the nu is just less than 1, strictly less than 1. It's 8 over 9. And in this, if you run this new MR, we see something completely counterintuitive. 
that the dark is the full unperturbed Newton MR, so it does what it's supposed to do. The function value, the gradient, everything goes down. But the, uh, the purple is the one that has some like 1% uh, noise added to it. The green is, uh, sorry, so, oh, sorry, this is 1% noise. This is 1 to the 10 to the minus 5 noise. So the noise is actually going down, but my performance is completely degrading. As you can see, the step size is coming down until the noise is very small, 10 to the minus 13, and I'm pretty much stagnating. And my step size is getting almost close to zero. Does so it have to do with the enforcement of the pseudo inverse? No, this has to do with the fact that uh, this, this new essentially has. So, so OK, so uh, this is, the, I think, that what's happening. So if you have small fraction of your gradient lying in null space of the Hessian, when you, when you perturb the subspace of the Hessian, some of these uh, null space, not this gradient, becomes in the range of uh, part of it will, will lie in that perturb uh, leftover. Um, now that part, when the epsilon goes to zero, that part starts blowing that's up. That's what that is, right. Right. So I didn't misunderstood what yeah, you said. Yeah, there. So yeah, exactly yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing that actually appears in numerical examples as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>
which means that, which, I mean, it seems like it means that uh, if, if, you know, as you're, as you're iterating and your eigenvalues are changing, there, there no eigenvalue will switch signs. Exactly. Which means very that if you start from a... You, you're very sharp. So, absolutely. So, th this could only, that would be a contradictory assumption if we require continuity of the Hessian. Remember, we don't, we don't need, eigenvalues and single values are continuously dependent on the Hessian. We assume Hessian could be completely discontinuous. And if that's the case, the eigenvalues could jump and s change sign and never cross zero. I see. Yeah. So, so. Okay. So, okay. So, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. Yeah, we need some sort. So we, we should avoid, it's like the curvature should remain somehow positive. You know, you, you can't just deal all of a sudden with the flat. You know, you, can get, you cannot get increasingly flat, otherwise second order is just not going to be good. So that jumping situation, so that can occur? Or when does that occur? Is that behavior you see where the eigenvalues, where the Hessian is continuous? Um, you were saying an actual example that this happens? Uh, yeah, I mean, how, like, for example, you know, can you have an invex function for which that happens? Right. Um, so invexity is sort of it's different notion than the, it could be just one time differentiable. It doesn't have to, have to be I twice see. differentiable. So uh, I have to say, these, are, these assumptions, a lot of them, uh, you can just wave your hand and say, well, the general is this and that. But I think one thing that we need to do is to study what, do they mean when they interact with each other? Cook up maybe examples that are interesting to satisfy all of this stuff. So this is very sort of at the beginning of, of looking at these, these assumptions and so on. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this, this, when I first thought about this, immediately I was panicking because it was like, okay, so what does that mean? But if you're not crossing zero, that means you're discontinuous. But it turned out we can completely allow for a Hessian to be entirely discontinuous. And uh, still, so that's okay. You can think of a diagonal Hessian um, whose elements are discontinuous and bounded away from zero. That will be fine.